right. Happy Friday, everybody. Crosstalk Friday live stream. How's it going? Hope everyone's doing okay. And uh, welcome to the live stream. And uh, let me know where you're coming in from. Oh, look, people are already saying that. Live from the, <laughs> hello from the Virgin Islands. All right, must be nice out there. Well, it is Friday. We got a lot to cover. I'm only going to live stream for about an hour. And of course, uh, let me go over some of the housekeeping first here. So, uh, as always, uh, you can join our Discord. The Discord is https colon slash slash discord.io slash crosstalk. Lots of fun people in there having great conversations. And uh, the activity actually seems to have picked up a lot in the Discord over the last uh, couple weeks or so. Uh, so thank you guys for that. I always enjoy reading uh, the conversations that are going, and I especially enjoy when someone has questions and they get helped out by other Discord members. That's absolutely my favorite. Uh, Crosstalk t-shirts are in stock. Uh, links should be down below. Oh, you know what? I realize I don't think I changed the description of this uh, live stream. Let me see. <clears throat> no, I did not. It says that we're announcing the Crosstalk Gimme Some Skin contest. Uh, so it's not terribly far off, <laughs> but... In this uh, live stream, we are actually going to be giving away these uh, wonderful Nano HD skins. And I'll pick some random winners. Uh, we'll talk about that too, because they're uh, the program that I used to pick Twitter winners isn't working anymore for whatever reason. Uh, so I'm just going to have to pick winners uh, randomly the old-fashioned way. Okay, what else do we have going on? Uh, let's see, we've got the Crosstalk Amazon store as well as the Crosstalk wish list down below in the description of the live stream if you're interested in checking that sort of stuff out. And I did want to say that Crosstalk PBX hosting is now available. You can find information on that on our webpage. Uh, very soon we will also have Crosstalk SIP available, uh, where uh, once again we... Uh, Boy, SIP providers, some SIP providers are just absolutely terrible. We had a SIP provider. Today, when I came into work, we had three or four customers that were complaining to us that they were not able to make outbound calls out of their phone system. And all three or four of those customers were using an old SIP provider that we used to use like two or three years ago. And at the time, they were great. They had good pricing. Their support was fine. But they just started going downhill and downhill. So we jumped ship off of that SIP provider, I mean, like I said, easily two years ago. But we still have some customers that are, that are still using them. You know, they, it's tough to switch SIP providers and change phone numbers and all that sort of stuff. And so come to find out that this morning, all of those customers were down. Their businesses were down. Their phones were down. They couldn't make outbound calls because this SIP provider changed or migrated some software in their back end, and when they made that change, they lost everyone's credit card information. So meaning that when it came time to do the monthly billing, or whatever it was, you know, whenever they, they ran out of uh, you know, bills for the month, whatever it was, something changed, or basically they would block outbound calls because the customer, quote unquote, hadn't paid their bill when it was their fault that they lost all of the credit card information. They just couldn't uh, recharge people's credit cards anymore. And so, of course, we had to deal with that. And no, uh, someone's saying, I'm assuming you, mean, you don't mean FlowRoute. It was not FlowRoute. It was a different provider. But I won't name the provider because I'm, I don't even want to give them that amount of publicity. Oh, but it just, drove, it just drives me crazy. And that's what I'm talking about. When you talk about cruddy SIP providers, a lot of them can give you really good pricing, but they actually don't know what the hell they're doing in the back end. And you know, you have to have reliable phone lines, you have to have reliable SIP service, or it's just such a headache for the businesses and for people like me who have to you know, manage those businesses and their phone systems. So ah, enough ranting about that. That was my morning. That's what I woke up to this morning. <laughs> so uh, let's see, how many people we got on the live stream? 61 people watching already. Welcome everyone. We got people from Florida, Switzerland, North Carolina, Finland, uh, Czech Republic. Awesome. Chicago. And yes, live stream Fridays. So thank you guys so much. Let me pop into this uh, other mode here. There we go. Um, okay, so let's see. 
What else we got going on? Phone calls are open. So if you guys want to place a call in, you can go ahead and call this number, 541-283-0651, and I will pick up the call. Uh, so, <laughs> so funny. Someone just wrote a topic, before we even take any phone calls, someone just wrote a topic here. Uh, Madrian just joined, sorry for off topic, but do we get an updated Unify IoT security video? Probably not, man. Uh, and because like I got, I can't tell you how many people said the same thing, which, okay, great. It's good. It's good demand for that Unify security video, but like it was so much effort to put together that IOT video. It's like, it's just super annoying when you put so much effort into someone and or into something and <laughs> you know, you release it and all anyone wants is, well, do the same video, but do it a different way. You know what I mean? And it's like, come on guys, you know, just, it's almost exactly the same to do that IOT video in Unify as it is to do it with the edge router that I use. And it's, it's a more intermediate topic. And so basically you kind of have to have the know-how in the first place to do that, that project. But also if you don't have the same equipment, like if you're running a PF sense firewall, you can do the same thing. It's just like, just translate it to Unify. It's it's almost exactly the same. But anyways, just, I, again, this must be ranting Friday, apparently. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you guys are getting me off on rants to start off with here, but, so chances are no, I'm not going to recreate that entire video with the Unify stack. Maybe one of these other, you know, content providers can do it. Uh, I don't run Unify here. I'm never going to run Unify again in my own personal office, and Unless you're a very small business with not a lot of needs, I wouldn't even recommend Unify, okay? So hopefully that's clear. Okay, so uh, let's see, a couple of fun things. Let's get on to a more fun topic. Uh, yesterday was National Password Day. And um, so yeah, it was just to bring awareness to strong passwords. And I happened to be talking with Tom Lawrence uh, it was either yesterday or the day before, I don't remember. And he told me about this website, DinoPass. This is a website that I had not heard about till Tom Lawrence told me about it two days ago. And this is a website that is geared as a password generator for kids. So it's basically try, trying to teach kids about strong password generation, which I think is such a wonderful idea. When my kids are at a point where they're going to be creating their own passwords for stuff that they're logging into, I'm definitely going to show them this site. So you can do a simple password and it kind of gives you sort of like funny passwords, right? It takes like this dictionary list of words and puts them together with some numbers and stuff. So it follows some pretty strong password um, rules. So simple password, itchy muskrat, pale snail, keen mask, you know, all these different wacky hair, but then you can also do strong passwords where it starts to throw in some uppercase letters and symbols and stuff. So that's pretty nice. That's pretty neat. Giant koala, ivory sugar, bad patch 78. So yeah, dinopass.com. If you guys have kids that are, you know, logging into Facebook and starting to get into Instagram and that sort of stuff, show them this website and, and definitely stress the importance, especially to your kids, of you know all of the best practices for passwords right so use different passwords for every site use strong passwords for every site uh, rotate your passwords occasionally you know all that sort of stuff instill that stuff early because like imagine like back when i was a kid this wasn't a problem right this wasn't something we had to deal with um, you know the internet didn't exist until i was in uh, you know just getting into college and getting out of high school and so yeah really cool uh, someone says, good thing I don't have kids as they would be grounded for logging into Facebook. Yeah, no, I hear that. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I actually, uh, just got off of Facebook and Instagram entirely. I just pulled the trigger finally. I haven't used Facebook or Instagram in probably two or three years, but, uh, last week I finally was like, you know what? I am so sick of this Facebook privacy stuff that I backed up all my Instagram pictures and I completely deleted my Instagram account. Then I went in and backed up all my Facebook pictures and completely deleted my Facebook account. I am now 100% no longer on either of those platforms. Um, 
not to say that Facebook doesn't have full profiles on me because they have full profiles on you even if you've never logged into Facebook in your life. But uh, yeah, at least I am uh, sort of jumping off of that, uh, that train. And I would encourage people to do the same. Uh, not everyone can because Facebook is still good as um, sort of a community organizational tool. Like my wife uses Facebook um, just to keep in touch with stuff that's happening in the community. Right, because most um, groups, you know, mom groups and you know school groups and that sort of stuff are on Facebook, and that's where they you know congregate. So some people still have to use it. I am one that I am completely off of it now. Um, okay, so I thought that was neat. Dinopass.com. Thanks, Tom Lawrence, for the tip on that. Ultra Weir 312. Ultra Wire Noisy Lane, or is that Noisy Lake? Anyways, <laughs> um, another interesting security thing that just came out is confidential mode in Gmail. So I don't know if you guys use Gmail or not, but uh, I use Gmail. I use it for my personal account. I also use it for Crosstalk Solutions. And they now have this new feature called confidential mode. So when you bring up a new email, there's a little um, sort of clock icon in the bottom system tray of the Gmail. And when you click on it, here I brought up a picture, it allows you to, here we go, confidential mode. Let's see if I can make that bigger. Sorry for anyone listening on the podcast, you can't see this. I will try to explain it as best I can. Uh, but basically confidential mode says options for recipients to forward, copy, print, or download this email's contents uh, will be disabled. So they can't forward, they can't copy, they can't print or download the email's contents. And then you can set the email to expire in a certain amount of time. The default time is one week. Additionally, you have the option to require a passcode. So basically a passcode to, they has to verify the person that is receiving the email in order to open up the email. Um, so basically, if your recipient doesn't use Gmail, they'll get a passcode by email, SMS passcode. Uh, recipients will get a passcode by SMS text message. So basically you can, when you send them an email, they have to, um, I guess, it's, I haven't actually tried this. So I don't know exactly how it works, but they either get a, an SMS code in email or they get an SMS code by text if they are already on Gmail. And, uh, and then they have to enter that code in order to open up your email, I suppose. So I think that's really neat. Now the SMS thing I think is a, is a little bit of a step too far. Maybe, I, I mean, I can't see myself personally using that. I don't really send anything that's so sensitive that that would be a thing, but maybe some people do. However, I could see the using the expiration and I do like the fact that you can't forward copy print or download an email's contents. That's pretty cool. Um, and someone in the chat says, um, uh, they can still screenshot it, right? So I imagine that that's true. Again, I haven't tested it, but I do like that um, this is, uh, yeah, I do like that this is a thing. It's making security a little bit better. Uh, so someone else says, do not work, screen dump is made a long time ago. So I, may, I imagine that, uh, Stefan, you're talking about doing a screen capture as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's fine, but you know, Better to have this than not have it. You know, like I said, I like, maybe sure there's easy ways around things like this, but not everyone is going to know about doing a screenshot. Not everyone's going to know about doing a print screen. You know, there. so, you know, for some emails, it's fine. And, you know, there's, a, you know, percentage wise, it's a numbers game. You know, if you send out a bunch of confidential emails, not everyone's going to screen grab them. So then it's worked in the cases where people um, didn't. So cool, I like that feature a lot. You know, security and privacy, anything that is edging towards more secure and more privacy, um, I am all, uh, all in favor of. Okay, so uh, once again, phone lines are open. If anyone's interested in calling, number is 541-283-0651. The rules for phone calls. Number one, get to the point. Number two, I am not here for your tech support. We are here doing general discussion questions and career advice only. I'm happy to do any of those things. And uh, let's see, one other thing. Let's see if anyone has some questions in the chat here. Let's see. I assume, so Icaranus, Icaranus, 
Uh, I assume so, since you can screenshot Netflix and that has actual DRM. Okay, they're still talking about the screenshot stuff with the Gmail. Okay, so Chris H says, when hanging a 9U deep 600 millimeter cabinet on the wall, what precautions do I need to take in order to make sure everything can be handled weight wise? The cabinet weighs 65 pounds and the equipment can be over 100. I'm assuming lag bolts to the studs, but is uh, two enough? Bracket allows for four across the top. Assume we'll only hit two studs. But if it's a if it's a 9U cabinet, so yes, lag bolts into the studs should be fine. Uh, you also want to make sure, make very, very sure that you're hitting the center of your studs, okay? Because you don't want to be off to the side a little bit, or that's just as bad as going straight into drywall with that thing. Um, and let's see, what else? I, I, I mean, you, I understand you say you can only do two, like wide, but can't you do two at the top and then two at the bottom for a total of four? Wouldn't that be the way that goes? Anyways. Um, no, uh, so John Max says, did I miss the giveaway? No, you did not. And let's see, don't stand under it for one precaution. Yeah, don't stand under that thing until, uh, until, you, get, <laughs> until you get it in there securely. You know, another thing that you can do that I've seen done with cabinets that are hanging on a wall is take a big piece of plywood and put the plywood, you know, like a good thick, like inch thick plywood or three quarter inch thick plywood and put that on the wall and you can even paint it or whatever to make it look nice and then screw your cabinet into the plywood, right? So that you're you're kind of going through the plywood and then into the studs and then you can affix the plywood up and down and even across maybe three studs instead of two or something like that. So there you go. Hopefully that helps answer your question. Uh, okay, so here we go with the edge router and uh, <laughs> not unify stuff again. Cyril says, hi, Chris, in a previous video, IoT, I've seen you're using an edge router and not unify. Why? Can you explain your choice? I explain the choice by a number of a number of things, right? If so again, I've said this so many times, guys, and I have a very old unify versus edge router video. A lot of that still stands even though unify has been updated a lot in the past 3 years. Unify has gotten a lot better. Unify has added some additional features, etc. I still prefer edge routers. Period. Why do I still prefer edge routers? There's a number of reasons, but mainly it's because they are a more robust routing engine than the Unify stuff. There's a lot more stuff you can do with edge routers that you can't do with Unify. Uh, VPN connections are easier in edge routers. Uh, well, maybe not easier, but I would say more solid in edge routers. Um, a really interesting thing that you can't do in Unify, I don't understand why they don't build this into Unify, you cannot view DHCP leases in Unify. If I just want to say, hey, what devices have IP addresses for my DHCP server? You can't do that in Unify. Yes, they have a quote unquote clients section where you can see all of the clients that are on your network, but that doesn't show you which of those clients are static versus DHCP. And it also doesn't update very quickly. It's just, it just doesn't work. Um, so, I, I just miss the ability to look at DHCP leases, which is something that I do pretty often. And then again, when I had my USG, now granted this would have been fixed with a USG Pro, but when I had my USG, uh, I have a 300 megabit internet connection. And when I first put it in, it was, it was working fine. I, the USG was giving me full speeds. And over time, the speeds were degrading and degrading and degrading and degrading. And I didn't have DPI turned on. I didn't have intrusion detection or any of that stuff turned on. And I was getting like 60 to 80 megabits of my 300 megabit connection max. And I tried everything that I could think of, including factory resetting and, and rebuilding the thing from scratch. And it would never get me over 100 megabits again. And so, you know, again, that's something that maybe could have been solved with a, with a, um, a, Uni a USG Pro. But man, yeah, that's some of the reasons. And, uh, and so I, you know, it just, it gets me like kind of heated because the more I worked with the USG, the less I liked it. Um, but again, that's not to say that it's not fine for some installations. I have USGs out for some of my clients and uh, they're running just fine. Okay. 
Uh, great question. Uh, let's see. What recommend? What certifications do you recommend for IT professionals? That's another great question. Uh, and then another follow-up. What's better, college diploma or certifications? Okay, so I'm probably not the best person to ask that question because not only do I not have a college degree, I also don't have any certifications. Okay, so to me, personally, the best thing for getting far in your IT career is experience, okay? Um, that's what I would always look for. So since I don't have certificates, when I was doing a lot of hiring and firing, um, you know, in previous positions, I would never look for people that had certifications. I also never put a lot of stock in people's college degrees, okay? There was a couple of things that I look for when I'm hiring someone to do this stuff. Number one, well, a few things. <clears throat> number one, what is your experience, right? Tell me about, and, and when I say what is your experience, I'm not just talking about like your past job history. That's certainly part of it, but I would actually quiz people, okay? I had people that were coming. I had a guy one time come in. He had certifications. He had all sorts of um, supposed experience in voice over IP, and I was hiring for a, voice over IP sales engineer position, right? So someone who is the brains behind the salesman and like when a salesman has someone on the line that's asking a technical question, they go to the sales engineer to help answer that question. That's the position that I was hiring for. I had a guy come in that had a good looking resume. That's why I brought him in in the first place. And then I started quizzing him on basic network stuff, including the question that he first failed. What does SIP stand for? So this is a guy that's interviewing for voice over IP sales engineer, and he couldn't tell me what SIP stands for. Okay. And so to me, it, that's what it's all about, right? When I'm hiring people, I look at their resume. Okay. looks like you have good work experience. Let's bring them in. And then I would start quizzing them. What's DNS? What's DHCP? What is SIP? Explain this, da, da, da. And I had this list of questions that would get progressively harder as it went down the list of questions. And by the time they got stumped, I could kind of figure out about the level of that person's experience and knowledge, right? So that's how I used to do it. The other things that I look for, I look for people who would be trying to figure this stuff out, even if they weren't getting paid for it, okay? So people whose like hobby is IT, because that's me. Right, like I learned Linux by myself because I was like working in a as a just a low level, um, you know, tier one sort of tech for a company, and I started hearing all about this, you know, Linux stuff. What is this Linux stuff? So what did I do? I built this computer at home out of spare parts I had lying around, and I downloaded onto a you know CD or whatever, and I installed Linux at home, and I spent four hours one night just learning how to download and install Linux because it was interesting to me. And it, that's like that driving factor of technology is so important, right? You can't, you can't learn that, right? That's something that you have to have. But when I hire someone like that, I know that they are going to be the type of person that when they get stuck on something, they're not just going to give up. It's going to like stick in their craw and they have to figure that out, right? And that's the type of person that I look for that to me is more important than certifications or college college degree because most most things can be learned right a college degree isn't going to tell you about the specifics of any particular job that you're going into it gives you a more general background of of you know stuff that you're doing um okay and then there was one other thing that i was um that i like to look for when i'm hiring i had three things in my mind and i think i lost the third one Yeah, I think I lost the third one. But regardless, certifications, I actually do have some certifications now. I've passed a couple Sangoma courses and stuff like that. So I actually do have a couple certifications, but I don't have any of the major certifications. I don't have an MCSC. I don't have a, you know, A plus or Network Plus certification. Um, I actually thought it would be a fun live stream idea if I took a sample Network Plus exam on a live stream cold. Like I've never past a lot network plus i've never um, studied for network plus but i've made a decent career in networking so it would be funny to 
um, you just sort of figure out like certification wise, like if I could pass or not, because if I don't pass the network plus, then it kind of tells you that you don't have to have that certification to be successful with a networking career, <laughs> right? Cause, cause I have a successful networking career. Uh, the other thing is if I do pass it, well, then it sort of shows you that it's pretty baseline knowledge of, um, of networking. And it's funny too, cause you never stop learning. You never stop learning in networking or computers or anything in IT. Um, you know, like one of the things that people have started to ask more and more about is IPv6. And I honestly don't know the first thing about IPv6. I've never looked into it. I've never tried to figure it out. I've never tried to set up a computer or a network with IPv6 other than, you know, um, you know, sometimes there's some weird internet stuff where like Google will only resolve on IPv6 and stuff like that I've seen. But I, you know, again, it's not that, and this is the, this is the thing. Like if some, if, if I was hiring for that position where I needed someone that knew about IPv6, it's like, how do you say this? It's like, I don't know anything about IPv6. Okay. But it's not because I'm stupid and it's not because, uh, I don't know anything about IT. It's because I haven't taken the time to learn that aspect of IT yet, right? I am fully confident in my capabilities. I know I could learn it. I just haven't taken the time to do it yet, right? And so like that's, that's the type of thing in IT. Like I like hiring people that have the capability of learning more than I like people that have certificates or college degrees. That's a nice way of saying it. Okay. Um, and that's the other thing. Yeah, I've been I've been in an IT career for 20 years. I've never had a need to even use IPv6 yet, guys. So like, especially where in the space that I work in, um, there's no need for IPv6 yet. Not to say that there never will be, but there's no need there. It's not there yet. So I think we're gonna see, what is that new Wi-Fi standard, Wi-Fi 6? I think we're going to see Wi-Fi 6 before we see, uh, before we see uh, IPv6. Okay. Uh, by the way, Super Chats are open. I see a lot of stuff going by the screen here, guys. If, uh, if you want a question answered 100%, give me a Super Chat. Super Chats are open. Any Super Chat that comes in, I will take the time to answer your question. Otherwise, it's going to be random hit or miss here. Uh, okay, The Hookup says, loved your last video on IoT VLAN. Have you checked out local control solutions for your smart home stuff? I think in your video you were using Tuya. Uh, I don't know what Tuya is, so I was definitely not using that in the video. Um, so no, I have not checked out local control solutions for smart home stuff. Although um, you guys use Simply Safe, I'm kind of interested in setting up a Simply Safe alarm system. Boy, I feel like this guy is kind of creepy. I, what, where is he? Right here. Look at this guy right here. I put this picture on my mural because I thought that this picture looked cool and I thought this guy was like a really interesting looking dude. But like seeing him over my shoulder, sorry for everyone on the podcast, but seeing him over my shoulder, man, he's kind of creepy. I feel like he's staring at me. I'm going to change that. Watch this. I love the mural. No touch. There we go. Change the picture. Okay. Actually, I don't like, I don't like that picture either. Not colorful enough. Let's see what else we got. Oh, that one's all right. I'm looking for what looks good on the screen here. There we go. This is some Banksy. There we go. We'll put on some Banksy there. Okay. <laughs> that is my mural, by the way. I just got that thing back in. Um, it was broken for a while. That is made by Netgear. And uh, and I have this uh, plan where you sign up and you get um, you get any sign kind of artwork. You can download and you create your favorites and you just displays on the screen all day and it looks beautiful and I absolutely love it. So I have Simply Safe and I really like it. It is on my IoT network for the second network connection. Awesome. Simply Safe, really easy to use and really easy to set up. Have had it for several years now. Awesome. Uh, Joshua Samuels, hey Chris, glad to see you're doing your own videos today. <laughs> okay, uh, two part question. I'm starting a WISP in Florida I, I looked to see if maybe that was someone I knew. Glad to see you're doing your own videos today. Or maybe just glad to see that you're live streaming today. I thought you might be someone I know. Okay, so two-part question. I'm starting a WISP in Florida. Awesome. I don't have the best line of sight to clients. What's the best way to complete a site survey? 
The best way to complete a site survey, assuming that you already have your wireless ISP access point up and running and functional, is to take a mobile setup, right? So some sort of like battery. Like if you go back through my videos, I did a video on the Jackery power bar. And that's a device that's like a good size battery that can power up one of these station antennas or subscriber antennas for a good long time. And if you use one of those, you can go around to somewhere near your client's location and you have a temporary way of seeing what your signal is um, from any given point, right? And so then, then depending on the coverage, you want to you have decisions to make about your access point as well, right? Because a lot of wireless ISP equipment these days is going to be in like if you're just going with public bands, it's going to be five gigahertz or two point four gigahertz, or you might have access to the uh, 3.65, I think I saw Brandon on here. Brandon, is it 3.65 gigahertz is the the one that you have to have a license for? Anyways, uh, there are other bands that aren't quite as crowded as 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. Um, and of course, the lower you go in the band, the more penetration you're going to get through obstacles, but the lower speeds you're going to receive, right? The higher you go, five, you know, 2.4, then up to 5 gigahertz, the faster speeds you're going to get, but you're more dependent on line of sight to make that connection solid. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's see. I'm still struggling to consider starting a wisp here. It's hard to look for backbone slash backhaul. Yeah, it is. That's the trickiest part. And we're actually going to be doing some pretty good wireless ISP videos. We have some plans for some cool projects coming up over this summer. And so stay tuned for that. Okay. Uh, Moya Sai says, any plans for a video on how to set up the payment system within Ubiquity software? So like, you talking about like UCRM or are you talking about like the captive portal stuff? Because the captive portal stuff, absolutely not. I don't like Ubiquity's captive portal solution. And the UCRM, yes, we will probably be doing some videos on UCRM. Question, one-to-one -one NAT using a USG, does UBNT plan to have a way to set up via web interface. I haven't the slightest idea if they have a plan to do that or not. Again, I'm so disinterested in Unify as a firewall and routing platform, okay, that I don't really even follow along with it anymore. I only pretty much use them for switches and access points at this point. Okay, let's see. Uh, Louis Cortez, Louis Cortez, I'm having issues with asterisk. Can you help me pro bono because I'm handicapped with several several palsy i think you mean cerebral palsy right uh if you can so the answer is no i can't help you one-on-one -on -one. um listen guys i have literally hours and hours and hours of videos on asterisk and free pbx and networking and unify like isn't that enough free help, guys? <laughs> like, isn't that... Haven't I given you enough, guys? <laughs> like, that's enough. Uh, okay, so why... Uh, good, uh, but sorry about that. Yeah, no, but no, I don't do one-on-one -on -one help. I put out free videos on YouTube, and then, you know, we have paying customers that, that pay for our one-on-one -on -one assistance. Um, okay, so uh, why don't you like Ubiquity's Captive Portal? I don't like it because it doesn't work very well. That's why I don't like it. Okay, so what are your thoughts on UBNT not offering Unify Protect for DIY hardware? I'm not going to go over that question. I covered that that topic extensively in my Uni Unify Protect video. I also covered that topic extensively on my last live stream, so I don't want to rehash the same sort of stuff. What is the name of that photo thing you have on the wall? That is a mural. I will bring it up right here. <laughs> there we go. Mural.com. I've talked about this on my live streams before too. Oops. Oh, they've got a Mother's Day special going on. Get it for your wife or mother. They're pretty expensive though. Um, the one that I have, I think was 595, no, it was $550. And then if you want the swivel mount that can swivel it um, horizontal or your landscape or um, portrait mode. There we go. Should automatically change to a different picture. 
Nope. Maybe I'm a liar. Nope. There it goes. Okay. So if you want to, uh, if you want to have the swivel mount so that you can swivel it back and forth and it's not just fixed in either portrait or landscape, uh, then you have to pay an extra $50 for that. And then it's also another 50 bucks for the service, 50 bucks a year for the service. There we go. Put it back in portrait mode. Uh, I've had it in landscape mode for the past like three weeks. So I, I just put it in portrait mode this morning because it's a different set of pictures that displays in portrait mode versus non-portrait mode. All right. I love this thing though. I love this, uh, this mural. It was sort of my, um, it was sort of just a gift to myself. I don't buy myself a lot of stuff that's not work related. <laughs> so I kind of just wanted, I just th saw it. I really liked it and I wanted to have it. And yeah, it was like six or $700, but, uh, I think it's worth it because I really, I really enjoy having it back there. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Jordan Tecklenburg. Tecklenburg. My client is looking at a point-to-point -point link. It is seven miles distance. What should I use? Um, you know, great question. There's all sorts of options out there. Um, what I would do is, yeah, as Brandon says, contact us for the point-to-point -point link. But if you want my quick opinion, if you're going with Ubiquity stuff, then you want the air fiber to go that distance. And if you're going with um, something like Cambium, they've got a lot of really solid point to point stuff as well. Uh, and there's other vendors out there also, you know, Mimosa and whomever else. Just the more important thing is getting an access point or a point to point solution that can actually cover that distance. And it's the like the line of sight, right? So having them up high enough so that it's not going to be a problem at that distance. Um, that's, that's the bigger issue. It's, it's more about the, um, spectrum that you're using and the, uh, line of sight than it is, um, the actual equipment that you're using. Uh, okay. So Cass says, hi, Chris, have you worked or have any experience working on Teltonica equipment and what do you think of it? Uh, I've never heard of it. What's Teltonica? Let me look it up. Teltonica. Teltonica, Internet of Things. Easy key to IoT, our products, vehicle tracking, networking, personal tracking. Uh, personal tracking? What is this? Teltonica. TMT250 is an autonomous personal tracker with GNSS, GSM, and Bluetooth connectivity. What does that mean? Personal tracker? Is this like you have to put this on you and it, uh, huh. Features. Oh, that's too, okay. Description. Teltonica TMT250 is an autonomous personal tracker with GNSS, GSM, and Bluetooth connectivity. This mini tracker is designed for people, pets, car monitoring, employee control, sport events, etc. IP67 waterproof case enables outside usage in harsh conditions. Moreover, large batteries capacity expense expands off application range where long battery lifetime is needed. In addition to that, TMT250 supports hand-free hands -free firmware and configuration update via Bluetooth. How big is it? Uh, looks like it's probably pretty small. Where's the... Oh yeah, 44 by 43 by 20 millimeters. That's tiny. Wow. Well, that's look. Uh, that's how you can track your uh, your significant other uh, when they're out on the town, and you want to know what they're up to, right? It's kind of a scary product, honestly. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I did see that there was a super chat. So the answer is no. I've never seen this before. Uh, I did see that there was a super chat. Let me roll back to that real quickly here. Uh, Stuart, if you want full local control, no cloud for smart devices, check out HomeAssistant.io. There are over 1,300 integrations, AKA components. All right, let's take a look. Homeassistant.io. Awaken your home. So is this uh, where they have like a control center like the Simply Safe does? Components, let's take a look at this. Oh, holy moly. Uh, support for these components is provided by Home Assistant, provided by the Home Assistant community. Oh, so it's like an open source, uh, open source uh, server or something. You can set up a server and then you can control these different uh, things here. I'm looking at the stuff that I have. I have Philips Hue, I have Plex, I have Ecovee, and of course, Google stuff, obviously. Interesting. 
how are their how's their documentation this documentation covers beginner to advanced topic around the installation setup configuration usage of home assistant all right well cool definitely something to check out i don't know anything about it but uh yeah good tip thank you Okay, let's see. What else we got here? What are your thoughts on Meraki equipment? Cisco bought them out. Yeah, Meraki. Listen, Meraki equipment's great uh, until you get to the pricing, right? So they're super, super expensive. And they have licensing fees. I don't recommend anything that has licensing fees, right? So now you've got a lot of really good providers who have non-licensed options, right? So Cambium Networks has all sorts of access points and um, equipment that is non-licensed, right? You don't have to pay a license fee. There's no fee to use a centralized portal for that equipment. Uh, Ruckus now has their Ruckus, Elished, uh, Ruckus Unleashed products, which um, the control for those products is on the access point itself, right? So if you have one access point up, the other access points get its information. You can control a grid of multiple access points through a single sort of master access point. So that's their answer to it. They don't have a centralized portal. I wish they did, um, but Ruckus stuff is super expensive too. And so, yeah, again, Meraki equipment's great. Functionally, it works fine. It's very strong equipment, but it's just too damn expensive. In this day and age, you don't need equipment that, that that's that expensive. Ruckus and Cambium, I would put against Meraki in terms of strength of product any day of the week, and you don't have to pay licensing fees on either of those other two options. So there you go. Uh, okay, so um, Bill Green, Chris, do you think, what do you think about zero tier and using it for a SIP controller instead of AWS, Vulture, etc.? Zero tier. I'm not familiar with ze what zero tier is. Uh, oh, looks like we got a phone call coming in. Let me see if I can grab this. Let me know if the audio is no good too, guys. All right, phone call from the 847 area code. What's your name? What can I do for you? Hey, Chris. This is John calling from Chicago. I'm a big fan. Hey, John. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Um, I wanted to ask a question um, regarding... IT consulting. Um, I was laid off in February. I've started to take my side business completely full time. And I wanted your opinion on uh, basically on customer acquisition. How are you finding new customers, specifically business customers, when you don't have an existing business relationship with them? And sub question would be, um, can we get an update on Crosstalk SIP if you have any updates? Sure. Um, okay. So first question, great question. And sorry to hear that you got laid off, man. That, uh, that exact same thing happened to me. Uh, where I was in a, a, a really nice job, I got laid off, and it's like, oh crap, you know, what do I do now? It's funny, I actually got laid off, and then uh, three days after I got laid off, I found out that my wife was pregnant with our second kid. So that was like... I have our second two at the end of May, so <laughs> yeah. I actually am <laughs> It's It kind of really brings the reality right down on your head, doesn't it? Well, yes, sir. the good news is, is that there is no shortage of IT work, but the problem, as you have identified here, is finding it, right? How do you get the word out? How do you do it? Now, I tried personally a number of different things uh, from literally going door to door and trying to, you know, pass out flyers and business cards and just talk to people about technology. That's one way to do it. Uh, another way to do it uh, I, I wouldn't recommend is I took out a newspaper ad for a while but ultimately that just cost me a lot of money and I got zero return out of that newspaper ad. So I definitely wouldn't recommend the newspaper ad. I'm also, by the way, in a very small community. So maybe there's other options out there for, for sort of larger communities. Um, what worked for me is not what's gonna work for everyone. What worked for me is I started this Crosstalk Solutions YouTube channel. And I had so much spare time from not having customers that I just started making videos. I started making tutorials for YouTube. And the more and more tutorials I made for YouTube, the more people watched them and the more my phone started ringing, right? And the more people started calling in, they wanted me to hire, to hire me to do stuff. And so that's kind of how I built the business. Now, you don't have to do YouTube for that kind of thing though, right? Like if you're not, you know, not everyone is... Um, I don't want to use the word capable. Not everyone wants to be on YouTube, right? No one wants to put a camera on themselves and film themselves doing stuff. That's you know, very few people want to do that actually. 
So what can you do instead though? You can do a lot of business networking um, is what I would recommend. So if you do get your foot in the door at a few businesses, um, go in there and say, listen, can you recommend me to other businesses? The other thing that you can do is while you're starting out, two things. Number one, cast a really wide net right? So you cast a really wide net of the services that you provide. And then as you get more and more customers, you'll be able to sort of pull that in to just the services that you're interested in providing. So like when I first started out, I was doing everything. I was doing point of sale systems. I was doing websites. I was doing, you know, computer rebuilding people's computers and stuff like that. I would do literally anything that would get me a buck. And then as it um, as I got enough business, I pared it down to just voice over IP and networking. And let's see, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, give do do work as uh, for, as favors for people, right? So if you get out there and you're going door to door, or you're just trying to find work, sell yourself, you know, pretty pretty. Give people really good deals, basically, right? Get out there and say, look, I will do this for almost next to nothing because I just need a, I just need money and you know, I'm trying to build this business. And it's better to work for next to nothing and impress a customer than it is to not work at all, okay? Um, and then of course, what you can do is say, hey, listen, if you liked what I did for you, then recommend me to other businesses and other people that can use my services, right? And then start getting that word of mouth going. Um, so I don't know, what do you think about all of that so far? I think that sounds great, and, and that's definitely what I'm going to try to do. I, I appreciate the advice. Someone said, you, your caller may want to look at joining a BNI, Business Networking International Group. It is a great way to generate referrals. So that's true. So one of the things that I did do when I started out this business that got me a couple of jobs is I joined the local Chamber of Commerce, and I started going to all of the Chamber of Commerce events. They have a weekly luncheon. They also have like a, you know, once or twice a month, they do like some like dinner party type thing, after hours event. Um, so that's a networking event where you're gonna run into a lot of local business owners. And that's another way to start handing out your card to everyone that's at that event. And what you'll find is that a lot of people are not only needing good IT assistance, but a lot of people are kind of just interested in chatting about computer stuff. Like once you become known as the computer guy, you're now the guy that people are gonna start coming to when they have questions and stuff. So that's another way to do it, absolutely. That sounds really great, thanks. As far as Crosstalk SIP goes, um, I'm getting really close. So I've got it almost ready to go. I have an appointment on Monday to set up my first test customer. Everything should be like almost like 95% ready to rock and roll. And um, so hopefully within the next month, I will be putting out a notice probably on Twitter that I am looking for some uh, beta signups if anyone is interested in Crosstalk SIP signups. Um, so hopefully we're getting really close, but man, it's a lot of work getting something like that up off the ground. Even when I'm using a, like a backend wholesaler that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting for me, it's still a lot of work. What, let me ask you this. What area are you in? In Chicago. And um, like, a, like a specific uh, area of Chicago? I don't know Chicago very well. Um, so in the, in the north suburbs, um, just south of the Illinois-Wisconsin state line. Okay. So if anyone is in the north suburbs of Chicago and they're interested in, uh, in getting some help, there you go. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, and I'm interested in potentially you know, hearing more about the, the Crosstalk SIP solution, if you're going to be reselling that. And uh, I'll, I'll let you go. I'll get off the phone because I'm sure you have some other callers that want to you know, get in here too. But I, it's, I have a couple of clients that are actually using Bonage Business right now. Okay. And while it works okay and it seems like it's a pretty robust solution, it seems like it might be a little pricey. Maybe it's not. Maybe, I, mean, I haven't done a lot of research in the space, but I'm interested in looking at something that, that is um, potentially – a lot better or, or, you know, maybe a lot better value for, you know, resale that also works, you know, better overall. So um, I'll leave you with that. Thanks very much for taking my call. Have a good one. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah. Thank you so much for calling. Uh, I would say on the crosstalk SIP, like I said, I'm not going to get into too much of the details yet because all of that is still being hashed out. Um, but um, if you are going to be reselling SIP, Vonage is very expensive. Vonage is a very expensive SIP provider. Um, they, I don't even know how to say it. 
I don't like Vonage that much and I don't like customers. Like I like taking people off of Vonage. There's a lot better SIP providers out there. Um, the one that we're currently recommending um, since we don't have Crosstalk SIP off the ground yet, we recommend VoIP.ms to people. They're pretty good. And if you're going to be reselling, then look for a provider that has a decent referral program. Uh, VoIP.ms, we've been referring them. Uh, the only thing they don't really have is a decent referral program. A decent referral program for SIP is going to get you monthly recurring revenue, right? So you get a percentage of all of the customers that you refer, you get a percentage of their total phone bill in perpetuity. All right, VoIP.ms unfortunately does not have that. So we're recommending them because they're a good provider and it's a stopgap until we can get Crosstalk SIP off the ground. Um, but they have, I think their referral program is like a $25 sign up bonus one time. So it's not, it's not great, unfortunately. Um, okay, so, so Brendan says, can you elaborate on Crosstalk SIP? What will you be offering? I can't actually, I, I again, I don't want to get too far into it um, since I'm still ironing out all of the, uh, the kinks, so to speak. And uh, I will have a Crosstalk SIP announcement at some point in the next, you know, month or two. Um, okay, so let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, let me put that phone number up again. If anyone else wants to call in, here's the number, 541-283-0651. Uh, feel free to call in. I will answer any questions. So Charles S. says, SIP trunk, Vox Telsis, $1 per call path, $1 per DID, and $0.01 cent per minute, cheap. Okay, so here's the thing that sets off major red flags for me, right? Cheap SIP providers are cheap because they are sacrificing something, okay? And so you gotta look at that aspect of it. What are they sacrificing? I've talked about this on the channel before, okay? But something I learned a long time ago is that any business can have three, there's three properties to a business good product, good service, and good pricing, okay? You're never going to get all three of those. Maybe maybe there's some companies, but it's very rare that you're gonna get all three of those, okay? So then you have to choose, you don't want a company that just provides only one of those three, right? So you gotta choose what's, what's the right answer, right? That SIP provider I was talking about earlier, they were only one of those things. They were good pricing. Now look at someone like VoIP.ms. Um, they've got a good product and they've got good customer service, okay? Their pricing is not the best. It's not as cheap as what this gentleman was mentioning a second ago. So they don't have the best pricing, but they're a solid product and they've got good customer service. So for me, especially for something like SIP trunking, that is something that I, that that's where I would like to be, right? I don't care if the price is a little bit more expensive. I'm not trying to get the absolute cheapest, um, you know, SIP trunk that I can possibly get. Okay, that's why it drives me nuts when I have people ask me questions about Google Voice and how do you integrate Google Voice with free PBX. And the reason they're asking me that question is because what they're asking me is how can I integrate free phone calls into free PBX? And I'm not interested in answering that question because I'm not interested in helping someone try to get free phone calls. Um, but, uh, look at a company like Ubiquity. Okay. Good product, good pricing, terrible support. Okay. So Ubiquity is two out of three of those. Okay. Look at someone like Cisco, good product, good support, really terrible pricing, right? Cisco stuff is super expensive, right? So just, you can almost take any company and put those three items up uh, and just see where they sort of fall. And then pick a company that, you know, that is what you're looking for, basically. Uh, all right, someone says I missed a super chat. Let me scroll back up here. All right, Callum McMillan. Callum? Callum? Sorry if I butcher your name. Uh, let me put this back up here, here we go. Uh, okay, so five pound super chat. Hello, Chris, I am from the UK and work in data comms. Is there any way to set up a Unify external portal server myself without paying? 
Also, Draytech, yes or no? So Draytech question, I don't know. I've never worked with Draytech, so I don't. I can't give you an opinion on that. Um, but is there a way to set up a Unify external portal server? Yeah, I mean you can set up um, like the like if you look at my blog here, Crosstalk Solutions. Here's a little. Oh, that's not the right place. Hang on, let's go to my blog, CrosstalkSolutions.com. Here we go. Bring it up. Uh, go to my blog. The definitive guide to hosted Unify is right here, okay? And this guide, look how look how comprehensive this is. And I even just updated it on 425 because uh, um, Oracle changed their Java licensing. And now they, the version of, I was using Oracle's official version of Java 8 for the build. And uh, they, you can't use that anymore without having a, an Oracle login. And I think you have to actually pay for it now. But you can set something like this up. Again, this is uh, $5 a month, so it's not free, but five bucks a month is nothing. It can handle at least uh, you know a few sites with probably a couple dozen pieces of equipment without even breaking a sweat. So this is a very comprehensive set of instructions for getting this thing up and running. Fully secure, let's encrypt certificate uh, for the HTTPS, yeah. Definitely, and it's just a good um, a good project. Like if you guys are interested in you know Vulture or DigitalOcean type um, server hosting, if you're interested in Unify, if you're interested in Linux, if you're interested in security, this project covers all of those things. You know, at least touches on all of those things. Um, so yeah, there you go. Okay, uh, Jeff says, I have great success with Broad Voice. I bought the Sangoma 40 system from Chris. Great guy to deal with. Well, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. And yeah, Broad Voice is actually decent. I haven't used them myself personally, but I have heard good things, and we do have some customers that are on that platform. Uh, okay, so let's see. Something to work out, show off to the boss. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you guys are welcome to take credit for all of my work here to <laughs> and build a really nice strongly secured Unify server and show it off to your boss and t take credit for it. I have no problem with that. Uh, Brad LaRose says, Chris, do you have any way of making free PBX send email to multiple email addresses from voicemail? Uh, so no, there isn't a way to do that within free PBX itself. Um, what you have to do is create an email group. So most, um, I know like Exchange can do it. Like most email providers are going to have a way to set up an email group where you can email like sales at company.com and then it distributes to everyone in the sales department, right? Then you set the voicemail to email notification to go to that email group and distribute out. And then that's sort of how you can work around that problem. Um, oh, you know what I just realized? Look at this, guys. Crosstalk Solutions has a check mark now. Hey, <laughs> I am verified. Awesome. I actually just contacted YouTube about that yesterday because you can now get a check mark after you hit 100,000 subscribers. So it looks like Crosstalk Solutions is official. I got the check mark. I am verified. That probably shows off on my channel too. Let me pull that up while I'm talking here because I want to see uh, crosstalksolutions.com. Oh, no, YouTube dot slash crosstalk. Why well, YouTube dot com slash crosstalk solutions. Turn off my stinking intro video. Yeah, look at that. I've got a, uh, awesome. I've got a check mark now. Woohoo! Let me screenshot that. Verified, baby. Look at that. Crosstalk solutions. Woohoo! <laughs> I've never had a check mark make me so excited. <laughs> All right, let's get rid of that. Okay, um, so let's see. What else do we have going on? Chris, oh yeah, that's the one that you guys asked. Okay, guys, let me pop up the phone number one more time. If uh, questions and calls or questions or everything's sort of uh, slowing down at this point, we're probably going to um, end this live stream. I think I've been streaming for about an hour, almost exactly an hour, 59 minutes and 24 seconds. Uh, so that's about, I know it's been an hour because my voice starts to go out. But here's the phone number, 541-283-0651. If you guys are interested in speaking with uh, me on this live stream, call in anytime. And uh, let's see if we have any more questions. Any more questions that come by, let me know. Oh, there was one other thing I was going to show you guys. Um, this was kind of interesting. So the EFF put out this article a couple weeks ago. 
And this, uh, there was a ruling in Fairfax County Circuit Court, I guess it's Fairfax County, Virginia, where what they found were that people were using, or that the authorities were using these ALPRs, or Automated License Plate Readers. So basically, like, if you have a checkpoint, you know, where a lot of cars are driving through a checkpoint, or they have these mounted to police cars, so when they pull someone over, they automatically read the license plates of the cars that are around them. And they found that these people were um, just storing all license plate data. So basically like, here's your license plate number. Here's your basically like your location where your license plate was spotted. And here's the date and time. So even if you didn't um, commit a crime or anything, <clears throat> excuse me, they were keeping all of that data. And that's like a crazy invasion of privacy to start, you know, logging all of that stuff. And so this is happening probably all over the place. Uh, I do have a phone call coming in. I'll grab you in just a second. Hang on the line. Um, but like, what a crazy invasion of privacy. So the ACLU sued them about this. And now Fairfax County, Virginia has to purge all license plate data that was not used in coordination with a, you know, a criminal um, proceeding. So that's pretty awesome. That was kind of a win for uh, for privacy, but like that's the kind of stuff that we're we're facing now. Not only that, but also um, um, like facial recognition. There was an article that was that came out a couple weeks ago where um, they they are finding it people are finding it harder to opt out of facial recognition at the airport. So they're starting to use facial recognition for um, ticketing and stuff. And like for checking, you know, instead of checking your passport, now they're going to scan your face. Well, what if you don't want to have your face in a database? Now you got to figure out how to talk your way around that. So pretty scary topics coming up. Let me grab this phone call. Call coming in from the 757 area code. 757, uh, what's your name and what can I do for you? Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm calling because uh, in the past, you guys had the unlimited 4G hotspot plans. Are you guys doing that anymore or have you stopped? So we still do. That's a great question, Andrew. Um, so we still do 4G plans, but actually they, I think we were using Sprint and AT&T and one, of the, one or the other of those had the unlimited plans. I forget which one it was. They discontinued that service. So we would still be selling unlimited plans if we could but they actually stopped um, allowing us to resell them. I think they stopped a bit just start providing them altogether. So um, the one tip that I found though, is that you can get pretty close to, un I don't know if it's like, I, I think it's just really cheap 4G SIM cards from Twilio. <clears throat> have you looked into them at all for 4G SIM cards? I have not. Um... I live in an area where the, it's just DSL on the lowest speed possible. So it's averages about uh, 0.25 megs down. And so I've been looking at other options and I contacted you guys maybe a year or six months ago and uh, you didn't have, you didn't have any more in stock of the 4G plan. So just call and check on that. So you said Twilio? Uh, Twilio, T-W-I-L-I-O. And Twilio, I'm trying to find, I'm looking it up on the website right now. I don't see, they, I know that Twilio had, oh, here we go, Super Sim. Oh, it says coming soon. Coming soon? I thought they already had this. Oh, anyways, but check out Twilio. They they might have it. I, 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 because, okay, so I don't do the 4G here at Crosstalk. We have a guy for that, my guy, David Barger. He's like a super networking genius, and he's like got all this 4G stuff dialed in. Um, David is the one who told me about Twilio, um, and he sent me a link and I feel like it was available when he sent me the link, but now it's not, it says it's coming soon. So I don't know, but yeah, check out Twilio. That might be an option for you. Otherwise, um, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Unfortunately, you got to pay or you got to go with uh, satellite internet, which is just terrible. Yeah, that, that's, I'm going to hold on to my DSL line with my cold dead hands before I let go of that um, and get satellite. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And um, my only other option where I am is, is uh, through a WIF. And uh, that WIF has a lot of security issues and just other various problems. So um, that's why I was kind of hoping you guys would get those 4G plans back in stock. So, you, so Twilo is what you recommend. 
Um, uh, do you well, know let's, let's clear that up. I don't recommend them. I just know that they, I believe right. they offer okay. relatively inexpec- uh, inexpensive SIM card for 4G. Okay. Um, and then my next question is, do you know if AT&T's like, unlimited cell plan works with uh, cell modems and they, just, they don't block the, the IMEI number after it realizes it's not a cell phone? Uh, that I don't know. Uh, like I said, I'm not the 4G wireless uh, LTE expert here. So uh, if you can, just email us back um, and and uh, Dave will tell you all about it. He'll tell you what's available. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, one other thing, uh, another option you didn't mention is start your own wireless ISP. Yeah, I've looked into that. Um, I'm just not sure if I can really get funding to do it and also um, – power space because they've kind of taken over the area um with with their service even though it's pretty unreliable they've they've kind of dominated the the area so well that's that's disheartening but like i said there's where there's a will there's a way if you uh if you can find some tower space or just come up with a creative solution um you know find someone that's high up on a with a good vantage point and see if you can't convince them to throw up a small tower and, and, you know, pay for their internet in order to spread internet out to other people, something like that, you know, obviously check with all local regulations and stuff, but you know, right. said, where there's a will, there's a way there's people that are in like very remote areas of the world that are throwing up wireless ISPs and, uh, and it's working out pretty well. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you, Chris. No problem. Thanks for calling. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye now. All right, so let's see. Here we go. Uh, so some people are mentioning. Also, check the chat here because uh, some people are mentioning. Let me put that back up. Some mentioning um, uh, unlimited plans from AT and T. That sort of good stuff. Uh, Joshua Samuel says, "What's your email address?" Our email is info at crosstalksolutions.com. That'll get you right in there. Uh, Otis Granville, howdy, y'all from Texas. Can you do a show on your live stream setup? Uh maybe i you know the thing is there's so many content creators and it's like almost like kind of a rite of passage it seems that at some point you have to do a video on like hey here's my setup and i've talked about my setup a lot on um on different videos and live streams etc yes i am using obs uh for uh john uh, mac who just asked that here i'll even drag this over here wait let me go back to this view get the unlimited obs view here there we go. Sorry for podcast listeners. I'm showing a <laughs> OBS thing here. Uh, and then I've just got different things set up. So here's my Be Right Back. Full screen face cam, camera with chat, desktop with chat, and my phone call window. So it's really simple. I'm not even using um, OBS to like its full capabilities. But uh, okay, there you go. And so no, I probably won't do a video on it um, just because I don't know. I feel like that's, uh, I just feel like that's kind of boring for, um, for, for people that aren't interested in that. And there's been so many people that have better setups than I do that have already done videos on their setups that, you know, I'd say just go watch one of theirs, <laughs> watch one of theirs, though. but they do it better than I do. Uh, Brad LaRose says, so Chris, do you have any business you can recommend in the St. Louis area? We're watching, we are launching our S Corp very soon. And I don't know how you associated with other businesses. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Do you have any business you can recommend in the St. Louis area? Uh, I don't, so I don't know any, I don't have any contacts in St. Louis or anything like that. But again, same thing as I told the gentleman who called in earlier, if you, um, you know, if you just get out there and start doing business networking, that's one of the best ways to, to, you know, drum up some business for yourself. Uh, oh, we didn't give away any nano HD skins guys. Let's do that. What am I thinking? I was about to end this live stream. Uh, all right, let me do this. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Because I the, the program that I used before to do the giveaways is not working anymore. Okay? So I have um, basically done a search for all people that entered with the hashtag crosstalk, give me some skin. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to kind of scroll up and down. I'm going to close my eyes and then I'm going to stop somewhere and I'm going to point at the screen and that's going to be the winner. Okay. That's not even that random, but (laughs) 
Uh, I don't know how else to do it. I literally spent half an hour before this live stream researching how I can just pick a random um, tweet from someone who used that hashtag, and it's just not possible. It's just not possible to do it for free anyways. So that's how we're going to do it, and next time I run a contest, I'm just going to have to uh, uh, not do a hashtag Twitter contest because apparently that just doesn't work anymore. Okay, so the first one that we're going to give away, I will close my eyes. And I'm going to scroll up and scroll down, and then I will hover my mouse over one of these, I think, right there, and stop. Let me see what I got. Where's my mouse? Oh, it came over. It was way over there. Hang on. <laughs> I got to get better at this. All right. Close my eyes. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, I'm not even running the thing up and down. There we go. Now I'm running it up and down. Close my eyes. Stop. Mouse goes right here. All right. Jack. All right, so uh, at JXCK Sweeney, Jack Sweeney, Crosstalk, give me some skin. Black UAPHD skin would be a nice touch to my network. All right, I'm going to print screen that. Jack, you got it. Okay, so there is the black one. Where is that one? Wood. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, camo. Black, there we go. This is probably my favorite too. Uh, so I'm actually kind of sad to see this one go. But Jack, I, a promise is a promise. And I said that I would be giving these away. So there we go. There is the black Nano HD skin. Looks beautiful. That is the one that I was hoping to keep. <laughs> it's all right. All right, so the black one is gone. All right, let's give away one more. Same thing. Uh, that was sort of in the middle. I will pick towards... All right, first person to comment, top or bottom, and I will pick one out of the top section or the bottom section. Waiting for someone to comment. Just say top or bottom. I know there's like a seven-second delay on... Uh, there we go, top. All right, Tony Papa says top. Okay. Okay, so uh, top is going to be like from here to here. Okay, so I'm closing my eyes, closing my eyes. I'm scrolling up and down the top. Oh, I missed it again. Scrolling up and down <coughs> and right here. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, Cholo Tolentino. <clears throat> hey, Chris, black, marble, or wood, any one would be awesome. We're going to print screen that. I will send you guys DMs too and let you know that you won. Okay, there we go. And that is the... <clears throat> I will give away the Marvel skin since you gave me the choice here. Uh, all right, so uh, Cholo Tolentino, you're getting this beautiful Marvel Nano HD skin. There we go. That's the one that I almost broke. So sorry if it is actually broken. I don't think it is, but <laughs> if it was. All right. And um, should I do one more? I've got two more left. I've got a wood grain and a camo. Should I do one more, you guys? What do you think? Of course you're going to say yes, right? All right. I will pick this last one out of the bottom section. All right. So here we go. Scrolling, scrolling. I'll cover my eyes again. And stop. And this one right here. All right. Jersey's Tech Life. You have won the... Well, he said black skin. But you know what? Uh, I, since I picked you anyways, I'm just going to give you the... Um, which one do I want to keep? That's really what it boils down to. Do I want to keep the camel one or do I want to keep the wood grain one? I think I want to keep the wood grain. So I'm going to give you the camo skin. Uh, Jersey's Tech Life. Let me make a little print screen here copy that all right there we go so i will get you the camo skin and there we go some giveaways hope you guys enjoy that now i have a, another big giveaway coming really soon you guys um so stay tuned for that it's a big contest we've got coming up pretty soon and so uh yeah if you guys are interested just keep make sure you're following me on twitter that is at Crosstalk SOL. Make sure you're on Discord, which is discord.io slash Crosstalk. And of course, make sure you're subscribed to the Crosstalk Solutions YouTube channel where we are 
almost, I think, 109,000 subscribers now. So thank you guys all so very much. Um, I still don't have my silver play button. I don't know what the holdup is on that. But, uh, you know, it's funny because um, Paul's Hardware hit 1 million subscribers on almost the exact same day that I hit 100,000 subscribers. And he already did an unboxing and video on his gold play button, the 1 million subscriber play button. And I was like, wait a minute, where's my play button? <laughs> I should be getting my silver play button. And it turns out that they never sent me the notification for it. They, uh, so now it's like their internal team is checking on it for me. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, but okay, I hope you guys enjoyed this live stream. As always, thank you so much for joining. Congratulations to the winners of these skins. Sorry I waited till the last second. That was not intentional. I literally just forgot until I was about to close it down. So uh, if you guys were watching the whole thing and waiting for that, I really apologize. That was I was trying to like, I wanted to sprinkle them in through the live stream, but I, I just screwed up. Uh, okay, I will do another live stream coming up real soon. Stay tuned to crosstalksolutions.com for that. Well, don't literally stay tuned. I mean, you don't need to be watching the channel all the time for live streams, but follow me on Twitter, that sort of good stuff. And uh, I try to announce live streams. I didn't announce this one, but I do try to announce live streams when I'm going to do them. And uh, that's about it. I hope you guys all have a good Friday and a good weekend. And we will see you all in the next live stream.